Crossroads, Urban and Suburban Identities in New Jersey Politics and Culture. And I want to give you a background of why we're doing this, uh, the reason, and why it's Nicholas Martini. Last year, the Nicholas Martini Foundation donated the Nicholas Martini papers to the Cheng Library Auditorium of William Patterson University. So here we have this volume of scholarly material documenting the history of the first Italian-American mayor of Passaic, the first ethnic mayor of Passaic, the first new immigrant mayor of Passaic. Um, this is a, a resource for William Patterson students. This is a resource for scholars. I mean, New York City urban history is not that documented. So we thought that we needed something else. And the Nicholas Martini Foundation also thought so. and wanted to honor Nicholas Martini in a little, a little further. And so they donated money for us to have this conference. So this, this conference, which began with just archiving the papers, is now a conference to honor Nicholas Martini and to honor what he stood for. He was a mayor, uh, immigrant, Italian-American. He was part of the American political system. His family came from abroad, and yet he became a solid American citizen. So this is a conference to honor him and to honor what he stood for. So I'm glad to welcome everyone. Thank you, and hopefully more people will be coming in. Uh, those papers, by the way, are prepared, organized, and have been conserved, and there is a finding aid. So you can just look through the index, and you'll see whatever you're looking for. Okay. This uh, conference was put together by a planning committee of the sociology department, the history department, the political science department, and the library. And I want to thank everyone in that planning committee for their participation. The first person, whoa, what am I doing wrong? I have to come closer. No, bring it closer to me. Okay, I, the first person I'm going to introduce is the president of William Patterson University, President William Arnold Spurt. Good morning. I bring greetings from the entire William Patterson University community, and it seems to me that it's very appropriate for us to have this conference here at William Patterson, because William Patterson really, William Patterson University, is at the crossroads of the urban and suburban communities. Uh, we're probably equidistant from the center of Patterson and the center of Franklin Lakes. Uh, and so as we grapple with who we are and how we serve our community, uh, this is a wonderful conference to begin with. I'd also point out that this is the 150th anniversary of the university, and uh, we're celebrating our beginnings as a school for teachers in the city of Patterson. We were created to deal with the needs of the children of the silk workers. And we have kept true to that public agenda, dealing with the needs of the public in the surrounding communities. So for a number of reasons, it's very appropriate that we have this conference here today. And I'm delighted to be here as well. Good morning. Thank you. Our first speaker will be Professor Michael Ebner. And I want to say right off the bat that Michael Ebner is a Jersey boy. Okay? He was born in Patterson, raised in Passaic and in Clifton. His family is still here, is still in New Jersey. I think his mother is here, his cousin is here, uncle is here. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> so we're glad to have you. Okay. So he is a Jersey boy, and he has studied the history of Passaic. He has written a dissertation on the urbanization of Passaic. And one of the first things I read when I was in his class many, many years ago 
was an excerpt from his dissertation. So here I was in New York City at the City College of New York, reading about Passaic, reading about New Jersey for the first time, believe me, because in urban history, New Jersey is slighted. This is a very important conference, and Michael Epton is a very important speaker for it. Uh, he teaches at Lake Forest College in Illinois. He is the James D. Vale III Professor of History. He has a chair. He has several awards for excellence in teaching. And I wrote one of the letters of recommendation for one of those awards. I don't know if he knows it, but I was there. He is a prolific writer. He has written many, many articles. He has a book. Okay. Creating Chicago's North Shore on the suburb of Chicago. Huge, heavy home. Good. Um, he has received numerous research awards as well. He has been designated a fellow of the National Endowment for the Humanities. He has a PhD from the University of Virginia. So let me welcome Michael Ebner and introduce him to you. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> That's it. Yeah. Good morning, and thank you, Evelyn, for a lovely introduction. And I'll have some things to say about you in a moment. <laughs> I instantly accepted the invitation to be with you this morning. I have enjoyed associations over the years with three esteemed members of the William Patterson University Department of History, Joseph Brandis, Melvin Edelstein, and Evelyn Gonzalez. And I also wish to acknowledge the warmest welcome that I received at Cheng Library, where Anne Siliberte, Robert Walk, and Jill Pruden eased my way. But I suspect that I am with you this morning because of Professor Gonzalez, my former student. We met early in the 1970s. Well, I taught at the City College of New York, and our bond stretches over more than 30 years. Evelyn compiled a truly distinguished record as an undergraduate and proceeded to further her education at Columbia University, studying urban history with Kenneth T. Jackson. And I have enjoyed observing Evelyn's ascent from student at CCNY to doctoral candidate at Columbia University to professor at William Patterson University, where she now chairs the Department of History. This morning, I also re will return to my personal history in another way, because I shall talk with you 
about the Besaik story of Nicholas Martini. Now, the anthropologist Sherry Ortner has provided me with an inspiration. She is the author of a recent book, Reconstructing Memories of Newark, her own and her classmates who graduated in 1958 from Weequayoc High School. And the evocative title of that book is New Jersey Dreaming. Now, my departure from New Jersey, in a physical sense, occurred 31 years ago when I moved to Illinois. But I am still dreaming of Passaic. I regard it to borrow from a cultural historian, a concept from a cultural historian, I regard it as my emotional landscape. My paternal grandparents, Sam and Ida Ebner, settled upon Passaic as their home in or about 1915. And previously, they had resided in Manhattan, where they met and married soon after their separate migrations from Europe. And I suspect that my grandparents imagined Passaic as a place of opportunity that enabled them to find their way into American culture. And roughly 90 years after they arrived in New Jersey to raise five offsprings, two of whom are here today, my aunt and my uncle, members of the prolific Ebner family Although scattered to points elsewhere in New Jersey, in New England, in Chicago, and in California, retain their heartfelt identification with Passaic. Ida and Sam Ebner, of course, were hardly alone in appreciating their adopted hometown. Like Nicholas Martini, who will enter upon our stage momentarily. It is fair to proclaim that successive generations of Ebners benefited as a consequence of their nurturing a multi-generational kinship with Passaic. And although I have never had the pleasure of meeting Judge William Martini until this morning, I am rather confident that the sentiments which I have expressed about the sake as my emotional landscape correspond to the experiences of his own family. Nicholas Martini was born in Patterson in 1904, and he was shaped by a lifetime of experiences extending over is 87 years. But if the narrative of his long life that ended in 1991 comprises a bona fide Passaic story, I am certain that if he were present today, he would readily instruct me that his story is also the story of America, an American story. To be sure, Passaic and America are not one in the same. But as I have come to appreciate from my probing in the superb Nicholas Martini collection deposited at Cheng Library, I have come to appreciate that city and nation proved inextricably linked together by way of shaping his life. Now, the biographical details of Nicholas Martini occupy the very center of this story. It needs to be said at the outset that he served as mayor of Passaic from 1943 until 1947, presiding over its board of commissioners. He served on the commission without interruption from 1935 until 1955, 
and affirming a, a long established tradition in New Jersey. Nicholas Martini simultaneously held elective office in the government of Passaic County as a member of the Board of Chosen Freeholders. At one juncture, beginning in 1941, he was the presiding officer of the Board of Chosen Freeholders. And his service as an elected official, both in the city and county of Passaic, provided him with enormous gratification, I am certain. Other biographical details also merit notice and amplification, explaining much over the course of a lifetime was the unswerving devotion of Nicholas Martini to Italian-American causes. Literally from cradle to grave, he was identified with the sakes Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church, one of the two major Italian parishes in the city. He was honored in 1976 for a half century of service to his congregation. But like many other Italian Americans, as we know from recent scholarship on ethnicity and religion, Nicholas Martini also defined key aspects of his life strictly on secular grounds. He was a product of Passaic High School, a hothouse for upwardly mobile academic achievers. He then received his legal education from New Jersey Law School in Newark, the institution that we know today as Rutgers University Law School. The very fact that he attended public high school and then proceeded to complete his legal education underscores what we have learned from legal historians. Among Roman Catholics, it was Italian-American immigrants, more so than Irish or Poles, who cultivated the faith that schooling might culminate in upward mobility for their children. And this leads us to the political affiliation of Nicholas Martini. Unequivocally, he was a Republican. This represents another plausible pattern having to do with nationality cleavages that divided Roman Catholics in 20th century America. If Irish Catholics tended to send their daughters and their sons to parochial schools and identified themselves as Democrats, Italian Americans plied an alternative path. Other Italian Americans followed the same trajectory by way of identifying themselves politically as Republicans. Fiorello LaGuardia, the renowned mayor of New York City, commenced his political career as a Republican member of Congress representing a district in Manhattan. When the voters in New Haven, Connecticut elected their first Italian-American mayor in 1945, he was a Republican. And Paul G. DeMuro, who succeeded Mayor Martini in 1947, was a Republican. Also note of note, if only briefly, is the fact that politics in New Jersey from the 1920s to the 1940s was dominated by the iron grip of Frank Haig. Born to Irish immigrant parents, he was a Democrat. Mayor of Jersey City from 1917 until 1947, his reach extended beyond Hudson County to the state's judges, to the legislators, to the governor, to the congressional delegation, and into the White House. And despite this image exuding Franklin Delano Roosevelt's characteristic bonhomie, President Roosevelt himself had good reason to grow increasingly wary 
of Haig's omnipotence and reach. And the same could be said for voters in nearby Bergen, Essex, and Passaic counties. In Passaic County, two successive long-term congressmen, George N. Seeger, who served for 17 years beginning in 1940, and then Gordon Canfield, who served for 20 years beginning in 1941, were Republicans. In the formidable years of Nicholas Martini, I suspect the role of Haig surely imparted an impression. Martini no doubt appreciated the necessity of avoiding Boss Haig's taint as he made his own way up the rungs on the political ladder. I suspect that it was a Republican who helped shape Martini's youthful sensibilities about public affairs as an honorable calling. George Seeger, mayor of Passaic and then congressman from Passaic County, is the person who I think probably had influence upon Nicholas Martini. Now to appreciate Martini, we must also devote attention to the urban history of the same. At the beginning of the 20th century, it represented one of the nation's most intensely ethnic cities. When the United States Commission on Immigration, commonly known as the Dillingham Commission, issued its expansive report, 41 volumes in length, in 1910 and 1911, it singled out Passaic in volume 17. It lightly disguised Passaic by the argot of Community D, but Passaic was the subject of an elaborate analysis. The objective of the Dillingham Commission, I should clarify, was, was to affirm nativist sentiments which favored the imposition of federal restrictions that shut the door eventually on European immigration. The census of 1910, when Nicholas Martini was, 10, was six years old, reported that 85% of the six inhabitants were either immigrants or the native-born offsprings of foreign-born parents. Few cities in the nation encountered such a high proportion of foreign stock inhabitants. In addition to old stock, Irish, English, Scots, Dutch, and German, the city was transformed by the so-called new immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe, particularly Poles, Italians, and Russians. And undoubtedly, as Nicholas Martini progressed through his own, towards his own maturity, the distinctive demographic composition of the SAC exerted influence upon his own sensibilities. Certainly it taught him some essential lessons about the abiding struggle between pluralism and tribalism that colored the city's civic affairs. Now earning a living in Passaic compounded the com cultural complexities of its polyglot demography. At the center of its economy was the textile industry, dating to the decades immediately after the Civil War. The niche in this case was the manufacture of woolen and worsted cloth, taking place in red brick mills on the city's east side, most notably the respective operations of Botany and Forsman and Huffman. Proximity to New York City, hastened by excellent transportation via railway dating to 1853, also figured importantly in Passaic's industrialization. In the tri-state metropolitan region at the onset of the 20th century, the economy of Passaic amounted to one of the proliferating number of cogs in the complex network of specialized industrial centers tied to New York City's bottomless sources of capital, labor, and culture. In terms of total population, Passaic ranked ninth among the cities of New Jersey 
in 1910 with a population of almost 55,000. Nationally, it ranked 99th. Newark, historically the state's largest city, ranked 14th with a population of almost 348,000 people. Now, traditionally, textile production, whether in Passaic or elsewhere, relied on low-paying, low wages. Frequently, ethnic groups in Passaic found themselves vying competitively with one another for the meager advantages of employment within this system. And exacerbating the situation were workplace hazards as well as the cyclical ebbing and flowing of the law of supply and demand. Beginning in the 1870s, Passaic was the site of a succession of struggles launched by workers trying to organize themselves into unions. And the climatic moment was the year-long the year-long strike of 1926, a mighty and embittered struggle between labor and capital. The strike placed Passaic into the national spotlight. In one famous instance, Norman Thomas was briefly arrested when he sought to deliver an outdoor speech to an assembly of strikers. The strike also gained the attention of people as different as Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, Rabbi Stephen A. Wise, his daughter Justine Wise, later the distinguished uh, jurist and child advocate children's advocate, Justine Wise Pollier, Professor Felix Frankfurter, and even President Calvin Coolidge. Pioneering filmmakers produced a seven-minute depiction of the conflict. And subsequently, the strike of 1926 has been the source of numerous dissertations, articles, books, and conferences, including a conference that occurred at William Patterson University in 1976. Prophetically, Nicholas Martini opened his solo law practice in Passaic during 1926. Now, I do not believe that anyone could have attained immunity from the convulsion that overcame the city that year. Indisputably, the strike figured into the sensibilities that shaped and reshaped Passaic, New Jersey. Certainly my own father, age 13 at the time, and himself a resident of the East Side, occasionally spoke with me about what transpired. Jules Ebner told me about throngs of strikers watchful patrols of mounted police and occasional violence and the general enmity that surrounded the protracted struggle. Two pioneer historians of the American labor movement, Selig Perlman and Philip Taft, set what happened into a broader context. They write of Passaic, so far as public awareness was concerned, the Passaic strike was the outstanding uh, labor conflict of the Coolidge era. If the young attorney Nicholas Martini, age 22 at this juncture, was removed from the immediate ramifications of the textile strike, it clearly provided him with something akin to a postgraduate education. I suspect that the year 1926 may have focused his attention upon the economic system, the labor force, and the diverse demographic array. In the municipal election of 1927, the defeat of Commissioner Abram Preskill also may have made an impression on Nicholas Martini. Preskill had first been elected in 1919, re-elected in 1923. During the strike, he overtly and repeatedly opposed the cause of the strikers, which helps, I believe, to explain the enmity that he 
obtained in the community and hence his defeat. Now a few words about geography, an inescapable ingredient in narrating the urban history of Passaic. The divergence between the city's immigrant stock population and its native-born inhabitants was paramount. Its east side reflected the urbanization and industrialization widely associated with Passaic. Its west side uh, included single-family residences whose interior appointments conveyed a picture of a different Passaic. Workers in the textile mills, it goes without saying, resided on Passaic's densely populated east side, while the west side included larger, predominantly single-family residents. Now, an aspiring politician in Passaic, of course, needed to bridge these cultural cleavages. And this was all the more important in as much as election to the municipal government, the Board of Commissioners, was conducted in an at-large canvas. Ward representation had ended in 1911 when citizens voted by referendum to adopt the nonpartisan five-member Board of Commissioners, a reform favored by Governor Woodrow Wilson. A revealing footnote is worth citing. Although citywide, the vote to adopt the commission totaled 68% in favor. In the first ward, the immigrant ward, 31% favored the referendum. Nicholas Martini entered the complex political environment of Passaic for the first time in the municipal election of 1931. He was 27 years old. These contests, and I have personal memory of these contests dating to 1951 by my calculations, they amounted to larger than life public rituals. They mixed drama and comedy. Shakespeare, Walt Whitman, Oscar Wilde, each might have appreciated the circus-like pathos. Indisputably, these contests reflected the city's distinctive historical evolution. And in spite of an active, well-organized campaign, in this instance, Nicholas Martini failed to secure one of the five seats on the Board of Commissioners. And I have no doubt that this experience fortified him with important lessons that he applied in his future pursuits. In the election of 19... I'm unsure about that slide where it goes. In the election of 1930... Let's skip right through it. In the election of 1935, his candidacy prevailed. Eight years hence, as a consequence of placing first in the election of 1943, his fellow commissioners designated him as the mayor of Passaic. Now, my research in the assembled papers of Nicholas Martini provided an unparalleled opportunity to appreciate his approach to the electoral process, as well as how he conducted himself in an office of public trust. At the center of it all, whether running for the Board of Commissioners or running for the County Board of Freeholders, we discover that Nicholas Martini seldom encountered a stone that he ignored. A handful of examples. Campaign information, such as this palm card, was distributed not only in English, but also in other languages as well well. Lists were compiled. In this instance, the list was compiled by a friend of Nicholas Martini by the name of Harry Antman. And these, this was a list of prospective supporters on a certain street who the Martini campaign might contact for support on election day. The most careful attention was given by him to producing campaign paraphernalia. And for the historians in the room, 
we often talk about wonderful finds in the archives. This is a page from a ledger. I don't know if it's Nicholas Martini's handwriting or not, but it's good handwriting, I know that. And this is a list of contributions to his campaign. Um, and this list goes on page after page after page. And this is another gem. This is a simply two days in his calendar um, during the campaign. And uh, his days were filled, as you can see, with appointments and events. Campaign events were cognizant of the varied ethnic constituents constituencies in Passaic, and they were very sensitively organized so as to please rather than to ever offend. Nicholas Martini was a prolific correspondent. I'm going to come back to that. But in this instance, he dutifully acknowledged endorsements of his candidacy in this instance from a labor organization. Now, central to all of this activity was a basic endowment that explains much about the life of Nicholas Martini. This man possessed endless reserves of human energy. And we will see that even much later in his life. At some juncture, possibly as early as 1928, he also established the Nicholas Martini League. It, it remained an active force um, until at least the 1950s. Now the Nicholas Martini League, in a city rife with ethnic, class, and partisan separation, in a culture exacerbated by the ravages of the Great Depression, the Nicholas Martini League proved an artful device striving to transcend these divisions. I suspect that it also sublimated his connection to the Republican Party. The League organized social and political events in, the, in its name that enabled Nicholas Martini 12 months a year, election year or non-election year, to continually reinforce his stature in the public eye. And virtually all of these photographs, I should add, when you turn them over, it always has the same three or four words in his handwriting, I believe, send to the Herald News, where I trust they appear. I have no doubt about Nicholas Martini's objective. Via the League's activities, he was striving to secure his place within the hearts of the people of Passaic, who cast their ballots every four years in the fractious political contest that elected the five members who comprised the Board of Commissioners. Now, an observation offered by the political historian Alan Brinkley, writing about the 1930s, has helped me to grasp the role of the Martini League. Less and less, writes Professor Brinkley, was political life in the United States conducted personally because of the nation's layers of complexities spurred by industrial capitalism. Instead, political transactions were conducted post-sale via groups, associations, organizations, among them the Nicholas Martini League. Nicholas Martini, obviously a consummate politician, simultaneously showed himself an inspired public servant. From the moment he attained elective office on the Board of Commissioners, he was immersing himself endlessly in the administration of the city of Passaic. And key to his interest were matters of infrastructure. Here was a public official with vision. To cite an especially noteworthy example, 
Upon his first election to the Board of Commissioners in 1935, he immediately was pressing bureaucrats in the Public Works Administration, a New Deal agency with more than $1 billion at its disposal. At that time, that was a lot of money in pursuit of federal funds for massive public works projects in Passaic. And I might add that you can follow all this, not just in the Passaic Herald News, you can follow it in the New York Times. Somehow, this news was making the New York Times week after week, and his name was always in the article. It seemed to make no difference to Commissioner Martini that he was a Republican in pursuit of money controlled by the Democratic administration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. We know that Commissioner Martini ultimately would be deeply disappointed when his fellow commissioners failed to accept federal funds that would have resulted in depressing the Erie Railroad tracks that ran at grade level through the Central Business District. But he did have a great success. The height of his success was the federally financed public works project to drain the long obsolete Dundee Canal along First Street, rightfully regarded by residents of the East Side as a persistent environmental nuisance and a public health hazard. Now, Nicholas Martini served as the mayor of Passaic, as you know, from 1943 to 1947 and usually the honor of being mayor went to the high person in the election. At this juncture, he had been elected to three consecutive terms on the board, and simultaneously he had been serving uh, in the 1940s on the freeholders as well. His term as mayor brought Nicholas Martini to the pinnacle of his career as a public servant forever. He took particular pride in this attainment, mayor or former mayor of the same. Even if the statutory responsibilities of his office were more ceremonial than tangible by virtue of the state law that had created the commission form of governance, Mayor Martini understood how to make the most of this opportunity and it afforded him his opportunity to stand in his favorite place. And his favorite place was at the center of the city's public affairs. He relished this opening to lead, and he made the most of it. And although one would not claim as much for public consumption as Evelyn averred to, it would have been out of bounds for him to speak about this in public. Nicholas Martini surely savored in the privacy of his own thoughts the fact that he was the first Italian American to reach this office within the same. In addition to his traditional municipal responsibilities, Mayor Martini expanded his scope in the face of the international crisis confronted by the American nation. In the spirit of wartime bipartisanship fostered by the administration of President Franklin Roosevelt, he accepted an appointment as the Passaic Area Chair of the United States War Finance Commission. Now, some of you know that on a larger canvas, President Roosevelt appointed two distinguished Republicans to his cabinet as the war loomed, Henry Stimson as Secretary of the War and Frank Knox as Secretary of the Navy. Mayor Martini raised $123 million in Passaic and Bergen County locally to support the war effort. He also involved himself aggressively in war relief, and he always took particular care to underscore to the people of the sake that his activities encompassed Italians, Poles, and Jewish refugees. But what also is key to understand is that as a consequence of his role in war finance and relief, I believe Nicholas Martini broadened his vision. 
Over the ensuing decades, he showed himself devoted to international causes with particular philanthropic emphasis on creating educational opportunities in Europe. The wartime activities in Passaic and beyond represented a turning point in the public life of Nicholas Martini. Although re-elected to the Board of Commissioners in 1947 and again in 1951, this would be his fourth and his fifth consecutive terms, he never again served as mayor. Even if this fact is explained as a consequence of a post-war generational shift that pervaded the American polity, I sense his understandable disappointment. In the aftermath of the election of 1947, he was also relegated to a minority position on the Board of Commissioners by Mayor DeMuro. And although Commissioner Martini intrepidly fulfilled his responsibilities for the next eight years, I suspect that he felt thwarted by his distance from the center of public affairs in the Seine. There were also now hints that he had other interests. In 1952, he campaigned ardently for the election of Dwight D. Eisenhower's presidential campaign. And then in 1954, when Clifford Case was locked in a hotly contested recount that culminated in his election to the United States Senate, Nicholas Martini was at his side constantly representing him as his attorney. Rather than pursue a sixth term in 1955, Nicholas Martini announced that he would not seek re-election. He was 51 years old. His career as an elected official was at an end, although he continued to hold various appointed positions in the government of Passaic County. But occasionally, the voice of Nicholas Martini continued to be heard on a specific issues of public policy. Repeatedly, he sounded mournful notes over the decline of industrial manufacturing in Passaic. Its textile manufacturers had terminated their operations during the 1950s, followed by the departure of the producers of rubber-related goods like Okanite uh, during the 1970s. Three out of every four textile jobs disappeared between 1950 and 1980. Now, economists recognize this as a national restructuring of the post-war economy, labeling it the industrialization. Its full force debilitated the American manufacturing belt across the mid Northeast and Middle West by the 1970s. In the tri-state metropolitan region surrounded by New York City, there was a decline in manufacturing jobs of 1.1 million between 1969 and 1993. Nicholas Martini surely took more comfort from other pursuits in the ensuing 36 years of his long life. After he departed from Passaic's Board of Commissioners, he was very much occupied with his legal practice. At age 80, it is frequently recalled, he required the services of multiple ships of secretaries frequently six days a week, whom he occupied with dictation, correspondence, research, phone calls and filing. He was also devoting himself to service and philanthropy. Unico and Boys Town of Italy ranked prominently among these causes. International travel to England, Spain, and of course Italy surely was another source of pleasure. And at some juncture near the end of his life, he also made provision for the Nicholas Martini Foundation, and among the many recipients of its beneficence are institutions of advanced learning in New Jersey, including William Patterson University. 
There is no denying that he relished the company of people who occupied the limelight. His collected papers and memorabilia reveal that during the 1980s, he maintained active associations with prominent Democrats, no less than Republicans. Among them, former President, uh, President Ronald Reagan, former Vice President Walter Mondale, United States Senator Bill Bradley, and Governor Thomas Keene. Nicholas Martini also would have found immense satisfaction in the ascent of his nephew, William Martini, first as a member of the United States Congress and subsequently as a federal judge. Explaining Nicholas Martini's identification with people in high office, I surmise, was his own passionate devotion to the aspirations, to the ideals that he associated with American citizenship. Associations with presidents, senators, governors, Yankees, surely served to validate the crown of public service that he wore so proudly. Now one concluding question can, deserves our brief contemplation. I have repeatedly wondered whether Nicholas Martini harbored his own aspirations for higher office beyond the confines of City Hall and Passaic and the Passaic County Courthouse in Patterson. Truth be known, at the very moment he withdrew from electoral politics in 1955, speculation abounded about a imminent federal appointment being tendered by President Eisenhower. Whatever the reason, nothing more transpired. But I have detected in Nicholas Martini an enduring air of contentment. From outward appearances, Nicholas Martini steadfastly treated his political retirement gracefully. And here I thought about Alfred E. Smith, former governor of New York, and then defeated presidential nominee in 1928, who turned against the Democratic Party, who turned against the political ideals of his party and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who had displaced him as the party's candidate in 1932. If Nicholas Martini had any regrets, it surely encompassed the fact that he only served one four-year term as the mayor of Passaic, and he's in some very distinguished company there. Paul DeMuro, by comparison, served three terms between 1947 and 1963. But in the end, Nicholas Martini appeared to find satisfaction in what he achieved, whether as an elected official as an attorney, as an elder statesman, and as a philanthropist. But added to this list, I contend, stood another noteworthy, if less tangible, dimension of our narrative. I believe he was keenly aware, as Evelyn Gonzalez has also averred to, of his parents' humble origins in the 19th century. I believe that their lives provided him with a yardstick to take measure of his own great attainments in 20th century America. And while the closing curtain descended upon him in 1991, a memory endures that enables us to assay his public life from the vantage point of the 21st century. At the irreducible core in the life of Nicholas Martini, during its span of 87 years, there is a Passaic story. Thank you. Okay? We'll be back in 15 minutes.